All right. <clears throat> All right. So we are in our last week. Any questions or issues about anything related to where we're at? Final exam, final projects. I've seen a couple of the project presentations looking good so far from what I've seen. So the projects, I'll plan to um, group those all together like we did before with the other uh, presentations you made on pollination and seed dispersal. So I'll uh, put those in a format where you can see what other people have put together. And uh, what I usually do, if we had a live semester, we often have uh, live presentations, and then I have the students um, some of the questions from their, like I ask questions about their presentations on the final exam. Um, I think I'll probably do that. That's also should be a fairly easy way to get some points on your final exam. Uh, but I will have to group up the presentation files and get those ready for you. Uh, also preparing to have the uh, sample questions. The final exam will be a lot more like the um, second exam, a little bit less like the first exam. So more um, multiple choice or uh, fill in the blank kinds of questions, not, not as much free response kind of questions. But there will be some of those and I'll give you some samples as you get closer to the final exam. Final exam scheduled for uh, Thursday of next week. So if that uh, date doesn't work for you, let me know. And uh, as I, I sent an announcement or an email, I forget which one, um, about maybe checking your grade if you've got things in the past that you're getting zeros for. Um, it, there's a lot of that you could recover grades for something you've got a zero for. Um, honestly, this semester, your grade is, uh, a lot of people's grade is a reflection of how much they've been able to get done. So if you've skipped a topic prep or uh, lab assignment or anything along the way, you maybe got some zeros in your past, you can make up for those, but uh, try to do it soon and let me know that you're doing it. Um, I don't always get updates about what's happened in past assignments or like I, I may not be preparing to grade things that have already been graded. Alrighty. Nothing new. Okay, uh, so I'm kind of excited about the last couple topics. I enjoy this, uh, kind of brings it around to back to people, uh, the topic of plans, maybe some connections to lifestyle or careers or whatever you got in your future. Um, so there are lots of plants in the world. We've covered plants from very basic premises up to this point. Um, of course, most people, when they know plants, they're thinking about plants that are useful, right? What can you do with it? That's one of the more common questions. Like, all right, so you've identified that. What is it good for? And uh, the answer is not always something that is really beneficial for humans. Uh, but then there are quite a few plants that are very important for humans. So uh, humans across the globe are getting more, more calories from plants than any other food source. Most people anyway. So this is uh, just one example. This is a plant that is native to South America that people uh, have cultivated. And uh, it doesn't really, I don't know of places that have this plant really outside of South America. Sometimes you find it in um, sort of ethnic markets around. Uh, it's a plant called Oka, O-C-A. And this is a, a tuber that grows underground. So you can see that it's uh, kind of like, a lot like a potato, but it's got leaf scars on there, those little lines. And uh, kind of a, a similar convergent uh, selection from people for a starchy food source on a plant uh, that gets produced underground. We talked before about the benefits of potatoes, uh, being able to grow something that sort of stays underground and you can harvest them as you like from, uh, the, from the ground. And uh, it looks like it 
potato, but it's not all that closely related to potato. So this is a relative of, uh, if you know, wood sorrel locally. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different plants in this uh, genus Oxalis, and this is one of them that gets used for food. So uh, topic today is like plants we use for food and how they got that way, how they got to be associated with people in the first place, and in many cases, uh, how we got to make changes to them. So uh, before we go on too much farther, uh, we had a question last time, I made myself a note about it, and uh, it was kind of this question of how plants are responding to the the smells the, uh, their neighbors emit. And one of those we saw was methyl jasminate, or jasminate is kind of this common signaling molecule for uh, for danger, kind of like plants, plants being chewed on will release this jasminate Sometimes it goes through the body of a single plant and other parts of that plant respond to uh, one part of the plant being chewed on. And we saw an example where this gets transmitted through the air as a, a volatile compound and picked up by neighboring plants. Um, and the question I wanted to look into was like, is there a, a smelling, I don't know, is there a part of the, the receiving plant that's really uh, sniffing the air for this kind of thing? And I couldn't find anything that was like particular to uh, say a part of the plant that's you know, like devoted to sensing environmental methyl jasminate. So uh, there might still be something like that. I didn't find anything. Uh, I think basically it diffuses into the plant that is doing the sensing. And once it gets in there, really any part of that plant, uh, the cells respond by sensing the presence of uh, jasminate or something related to that. And uh, these are molecules in this study that uh, enzymes that can turn on gene expression, so like defense compounds or something like that, in response to a uh, presence of jasminate. So whether your own plant is making that or a neighbor plant is making that, it's kind of a common plant language across species for danger. So sometimes the response to danger is to put up more defenses. Okay, so uh, getting into plants that people find useful, um, I kind of like this diagram. This is a kind of a composite of a, a lot of different plant parts. It's not meant to be any one plant. Uh, you can see it's growing beans or it's growing peas and tomatoes at the same time. So uh, obviously not. As far as I know, there's no genetic modification that can make that happen just yet. Uh, but this is just showing all the parts of plants that people eat. So if you want to impress your family over the holidays and take a plant that's around the house that you're eating and say, I know what part of the plant this comes from. Uh, lots of examples. So on here, lots of highlighted parts of plants and familiar uh, vegetables in most cases, things that we would eat that come from those parts. So underground, a uh, potato is a tuber is a different part of a plant than a carrot, which is technically just a thickened root, uh, which is different from a bulb, for example, or a stem base. So uh, lots of different things here, different parts of plants. Uh, we are one of many animals that eat plants. And I guess maybe bottom line is people eat things you know, at a minimum, eat something that's going to provide them with calories and not kill them. So how do we get there? So uh, we're going to draw a distinction here between um, two related terms, cultivation and domestication. And if I'm not careful, I sometimes use them interchangeably, but that's a useful distinction to have. So cultivation, is basically where people will um, take a plant and kind of bring it into their own area and take care of it. 
And uh, this is going to contrast with the other form. The other word we're going to use is domestication. which involves actually changing the makeup of a plant. And uh, one of the themes of this lecture I like to keep in mind is to think about how we got to that point, right? So we have, uh, you know, a plant that's a, a cob of corn. Well, I can draw a cob of corn here. And it's this big honking thing, uh, grows on a plant, it, practically right at the right height to hold on to it. Uh, it's big, beefy thing, uh, stays on the plant where we can grab it. It's juicy, it's sweet, it's nutritious. And it's nothing like you would find in nature, right? Nobody's seen a wild corn plant. So what's going on with this thing? How do we get to this point? So it's sort of a, for most, Plants is this one, two, um, the plants that are really most familiar to us as food plants are these domesticated plants that we have uh, and our ancestors have modified to, to be a form that we like better. Um, but then they would have started off as something wild and gotten to the point where uh, first they were associated with people and then people made them different. So a couple examples here of plants that are a little bit less different from their wild versions. So a couple of examples that come to mind. Uh, some people are interested in foraging, right? You can go out and find plants that you can eat. Um, these are a couple that I would be okay eating if I found them in nature. And uh, the, the ones that are, I guess, a little more abundant are not native to our area, but we do have uh, native mulberries and our asparagus is a, a European import. And so domesticated plants are sort of the same thing as you might find in nature. So a wild mulberry, not all that different from a cultivated mulberry. Um, as we'll see, a lot of the, the changes that happen during domestication involve bigger fruits, uh, some peculiarities about reproduction, and these are sort of the size of fruit that's still adaptive for uh, birds to come and take these and spread the seeds or other animals. Um, maybe a, a native example, we've got uh, wild raspberries, wild blackberries. Those are pretty much available to us as a food in the same way that they're already out in nature. So we have raspberries out in nature. Uh, they didn't get there by somebody, by escaping somebody's garden. They've just always been in nature and they just happen to be something that's pretty appealing to, to people. Um, the asparagus here, we eat the, the green part as a vegetable, and so it's really just the tender shoot of a plant that's uh, not particularly toxic to us. So we take these things in nature and then they end up being cultivated by people. So um, I guess a, a couple thoughts, I'll get some feedback from you here. Uh, what does it take to take care of a plant? Let's say you wanted to enrich to get some asparagus around you. What does that take? Maybe you've done this in person. Flex those typey fingers. Has anybody grown asparagus?
All right. Thank you, Tom. Let me do this here. All right. So let's take a little bit of notes here. <clears throat> Hmm. What's the strawberry trick? Huh. I've never heard about that. Strawberries and asparagus. I'm making note for myself. All right. Uh, so asparagus is a perennial. If you've got asparagus, an asparagus patch on your property, it's something that should be giving you asparagus every year. You probably don't. Uh, maybe that, as an example, is maybe one that you don't think about very often. Um, but if you knew about asparagus and you wanted to incorporate that into your uh, area, if you wanted to maybe increase the number of asparagus plants that grow near you, uh, you could plant some seeds. I don't even know asparagus, but runners in maybe. So you can get pieces of asparagus from somebody and establish them in a place. Um, so like right now, we, we know how plants work. You can get advice from people and say, all right, if you want an asparagus, here are the seeds you put in the ground. You put them in this time of year, you cover them with this much soil, you fertilize them with this. You can get advice about that. Uh, but that's things that people sort of figured out over time and uh, it builds off of the most basic features. So cultivating plants, you're going to keep them alive. Um, basically taking care of them. Um, there's also maybe some plants that are more opportunist, so plants that might just grow around people on their own without having to be planted there. Uh, let's think about that for a second. Is it possible to cultivate something accidentally? Probably. My watermelon's gonna look like a loaf of bread. <laughs> so uh, weeds, weeds around the tomatoes. Okay, so I told you we're gonna take like kind of a historical perspective on here. Uh, let's say the first person to cultivate a watermelon, the, the wild version of a watermelon, they went out and they foraged and they said, oh, neat, I found this thing. I'm going to bring it back to where I live and eat it. And uh, my watermelon example, let's say you spit all the seeds out. Uh, just sort of bringing plants that you like, if you are eating them and discarding them near your village, uh, you're enriching for that process, right? So uh, take a watermelon, spit out the seeds. You've created a pile of watermelon seeds. Let's say you get some fruits that maybe go rotten and you throw them off to the side. Uh, you're going to have in your, in your periphery or in your waste areas, you're going to start getting some plants growing up from the seeds of what you've already brought to yourself, right? Uh, sometimes maybe a little bit, ones that you're pooping out poop out some seeds and grow some plants. Um, so really in this process of cultivating plants, uh, what, I, what I like to think of for perspective on here is that you don't need to be a botanist or a farmer to start farming, right? If you look back at, at 
humans and civilization just kind of accidentally doing what you would do anyway, uh, eating foods and ignoring the seeds or something like that, or just leaving some around, some plant parts around. They might grow into the plants that you like, uh, and that builds a little bit of a, an understanding, right? You've got, okay, look at the side of my village. Now I've got watermelon plants. <laughs> what luck? How did they get there? You, know, you could pretty, pretty well figure out the seed process pretty quickly at that point. Um, but another part of this is maybe it's not something that somebody intended to have around, and then they just sort of worked with what, what presented itself over time. So you can have this kind of accidental cultivation where you're not necessarily taking great care uh, over the plants that are growing near you. And then sometimes you might, you know, building that connection, you realize that you need these plants to live and maybe they do better if you create uh, environments that benefit them. So uh, less competition, more fertilizer, um, more light or whatever you could provide for them, drainage, watering, whatever they need. Over time, you get a better environment for your cultivated plants. Okay, so cultivated food plants, lots of examples, uh, lots of also cultivated plants for other reasons. So uh, some examples on here, plants that people have kept them, uh, kept around themselves for the benefit of fibers. So flax is a source of fiber for linen, uh, cotton, of course. Uh, maybe lumber, right? So trees that are better for building into whatever you need, homes or spears, uh, maybe enriching those growing around you. Uh, medicinal plants, this is the process of farming opium poppies, if anybody is curious about that one. Uh, these are opium poppies, and if you want to get the opium out of there, what they do is they scratch the, uh, this is a developing seed pod, or fruit of the opium poppy, uh, they scratch it and it bleeds this brightly colored sap. And as that dries, uh, basically has dried, chemically potent, essentially opium at that point. Uh, so having fields of this plant, this is not too different from the wild version of the opium poppy, um, but they've thoroughly enriched for it, as you can see in this illustration. So uh, medicinal plants, lumber plants, fiber plants, Something you find useful can also be subject to cultivation. A uh, little more interesting, I guess, if you want to think about where we got to the food and other plants we have with us today. A uh, little more interesting is this process of domestication. And so uh, domestication refers to changes that happen through selection. So what does it take to select something? What is the, like, biological meaning of selection. Anybody in evolution class this semester? So this idea of selection, um, so what does it mean to, let's see, the process of selection, right, is uh, differential survival, and or uh, survival and or reproduction and that has an effect on the genetics of future generations So if you had a group of people, 
let's say you were cultivating these watermelons that came up from the seeds that you grew, uh, one of these was bigger. And uh, it's not always going to be due to genetics, but let's say having bigger watermelons is due to the genetic makeup of random variation in the population. And there happen to be genetics for making bigger watermelons. Uh, that's going to maybe be one that you are uh, choosing the seeds from. So if you have a, an understanding of how seeds work, Grab your seeds from the bigger watermelon. If you plant seeds from a bigger watermelon, if you're doing that every time you choose what seeds to plant, then you're going to end up with bigger and bigger watermelons over time, right? So this is a directional selection, uh, intentional. That's what the artificial selection implies is sort of the intentional selection by people. So if you grew the seeds from that big watermelon, uh, over time you'd get more. Uh, more plants producing <clears throat> big, big watermelons in the future. Uh, the accidental selection version of this, right? Again, you don't have to be a person who thinks about uh, seeds or reproduction or anything. If a person takes this plant back to their village and it was you know, the biggest one out of the ones that are growing wild. This might have just caught their eye, uh, been more worthwhile to grab. And that's the one that got brought to the village and brought its genetics with it. So basically, uh, what I want to get at with this is that just the process of eating, <laughs> choosing what to eat, be a little bit choosy about what you eat. The world is full of plants and people are foraging. They're going to forage for the things that are uh, nutritionally worth their time more than others. So bringing that kind of plant back to the village already uh, is going to enrich for the ones that are producing more beneficial uh, products. Right? You buy that? Okay. So... <laughs> I'll assume that's a yes. Um, so bigger fruits is a kind of a common result of uh, domestication by people. So over here, more and bigger fruits, right? So you plant one uh, one tomato plant and you get the yield from that plant, right? So what is your yield number of tomatoes? times the size of an individual tomato, that means that for every one plant you could put in the ground, you get a certain amount of uh, tomato nutrients from that. So it's more efficient for a person to uh, plant a few things that are high producing versus a few things, or a lot of things that are low producing, right? So people, people kind of figure that over time too. Uh, what's good besides big? Bigger and more convenient, right? So a lot of these uh, features come down to convenience, and we'll go into detail on some of them. Uh, we saw in the hormones topic, we talked about abscission. So abscission is this process where uh, leaves and fruits, they just fall off the plant. Uh, if we're looking at fruits, that means that these fruits are uh, basically built to fall off the plant at the right time. So when they are ripe, fall off the plant. Uh, that enables dispersal. So if we're looking at a tomato example here, uh, maybe these tomatoes on the ground will stand a chance of getting dispersed by uh, mice or ants or something, get their seeds moved around a little bit. Uh, not always are these fruits just waiting on the plant for somebody to come and grab them. Uh, could just mean also that at the end of the season, if no animal has grabbed them, maybe they stand a decent chance of rolling around on the ground. So that kind of benefits the plant to get rid of the fruits, right? That's a pretty common feature for fruits to fall off the plant. But uh, if a person wants to come to their tomato plant and pick up a tomato that hasn't fallen on the ground and maybe been eaten by other animals on the ground, uh, they prefer to grab that fruit 
intact on the plant that's still holding on to it. Uh, a related process is shown over here in this uh, grass plant diagram. Uh, this process of shattering uh, is, is a fancier term for the abscission of uh, individual grains on a grass plant. So, I don't know how they came up with shattering, but it is pretty, builds a nice mental image, right? So uh, grass plants, the ancestors of wheat and rice and so on, uh, when their crop was mature, when the seeds are ready to go, the plant gets rid of them. The plant doesn't want to hold on to a thousand seeds of a wheat plant when those seeds could be left to disperse on the uh, to other places. But people don't like that so much. So holding on to seeds, holding on to fruits. Uh, other features here, um, day length dependence. So maybe a little more putting the, the reproductive timing uh, back into somebody else's control and into something that humans can have a little more influence on. Um, something that comes to mind with like day length dependence or uh, we got over here reduced dormancy, this idea that you want to be able to take a seed from your plant and throw it in the ground and bring up a new plant the next year, right? So uh, taking away the, the natural predisposition to stay in the ground for a while uh, those seeds, but instead depending on people to plant them every year and grow up into a new crop. Uh, I think I'll probably move on from this one. I've got some details that cover uh, little details of the parts of that diagram. Okay, so we talked about bigger, uh, bigger plants, bigger fruit parts. So uh, kind of a general feature if you look at uh, wild relatives versus their domesticated uh, uh, relatives is that we're looking at bigger portions of the thing people like. So you take a banana. Uh, this is on the right side here. This is a wild relative of a banana. Uh, big seeds, little bit of flesh. And in a wild environment, let's say this is attractive to an ape or mammal, or I don't know what disperses these in their native area in Asia. Uh, but there's a lot of seed that benefits the plant. And there's a little bit of fleshy, sweet nutrients, and that benefits the animal. And it's really like a, under natural selection conditions, it's really like as much incentive as it takes to pay off the animal to do the job. So we typically see in uh, natural fruits, a lot of seed and a little bit of flesh. So just, just a little bit, a little, little tidbit to get you going, uh, enough to make it worthwhile to carry this somewhere or to eat it and then poop out the seeds. Uh, under domestication, we take that same starting point and end up with a banana, which is all tasty uh, once you get inside the peel. And the seeds inside a banana, those are just little black specks in there. It's hardly anything to them. If you didn't know they were there, you wouldn't necessarily even look for them. Um, they're, they're tiny. They're not functional as seeds. They're like little black remnants of what the seeds used to be inside of the banana. So great for people, bad for the plant, right? The banana plant that is cultivated by people has no ability to spread itself by seeds. It's become dependent on people, and the people would be the ones that are um, spreading these around actually by vegetative reproduction or cloning. So they uh, cut them below ground and spread them out and you can increase your number of bananas that way, uh, even without seeds. Uh, another example here, this is the wild relative of corn, a uh, plant called Teosinte, native to Mexico. And that was the original corn cob. So these are uh, tough little things. They have hard outsides. There are not very many of them. And uh, in the natural wild relative, they break apart, shatter, and all these individual grains fall to the ground. So uh, kind of a rough starting point for the old corn plant there. All right, so uh, if we're eating 
the seeds, as is the case with the grains, then increase size in the seeds, uh, increase number of the seeds. If we are eating around the seeds, then we often see a decrease in the number or size of the seeds. Uh, so lots of seedless fruits as we've seen over time. Uh, one of the neat things you can do as you are kind of tracing the history of uh, plants being associated with people is you can uh, look for the uh, evidence of these same species in archaeological sites. And so uh, looking at, uh, sorry, I think I have archaeological sites on a future one. You can look uh, compared to their wild relatives. So a couple examples here uh, on the left is chickpeas. So wild chickpea, domesticated chickpea. On the right is basically wheat and one of its wild relatives. And comparing those, there's still some variation in the domesticated versions, but both of these, uh, again, people are eating the seeds. So chickpeas larger, larger seeds than their wild relatives, wheat larger than its wild relatives. Uh, shattering is a fairly common feature. So if plants don't have shattering, then their seeds basically stay on the plant. And that's not what you want as a plant for getting your seeds around. Um, so in the middle here, this is a soybean plant. I always find soybeans a little interesting around here, right? So soybeans, they grow them for the season. And they just leave the dang things out there through the winter. They're just so confident that these hairy little seed pods are going to stay on the plant and they come and harvest them the next year. And uh, they stay on the plant because people have selected them for those uh, soybeans to stay in the plant. Their wild relatives do something more like this, where the pod breaks open and these seeds are individually available to disperse on their own. Uh, same thing with rice. So here we have a couple genetic variants. Uh, on the right is a rice plant that's not shattering. So a person to harvest this, they can pull up this part of the rice plant and it's full of rice grains. That's great. You pick it up, you get a handful of rice. Uh, you pick this thing up on the left that's already shattered its seeds. Pick that up, you get like 10 rice grains. Uh, they've been lost. Rice is an aquatic grain and uh, once they're in the water, they're, they're really out of reach for a person to collect, store, and so on. So a really important step in uh, cultivating some of these plants that would normally disperse the seeds that we like to eat. Uh, all right, so I, I hinted at the ar archeological evidence before. Here's one piece of archeological evidence. Uh, we can look back, we can, we can compare living domesticated plants with their living wild relatives, and that's an important comparison. Another useful comparison is to find archaeological uh, remnants of these plants, pieces of plants that people were domesticating over time and see how they've changed. So here's one, uh, kind of an ancestral hob of corn. Uh, go back a couple to our Teosinte here. This is like a single line of uh, corn kernels alternating back and forth. Uh, hopefully you can think of a, a modern cob of corn. This is kind of in between. So we've got a few rows, like four or five rows of corn kernels all on one cob, but nothing not, uh, even close to what we have today with hundreds, I don't even know how many, how many corn kernels on a cob these days. Uh, we have a lot more than this, but this is kind of an intermediate stage. So you can kind of track this over time. And uh, again, as this happens, as you get more, uh, more resources per unit, per, per harvested unit, per corn plant, uh, the effort required goes down. Click on that one, Tom. All right, 800 to 1200 kernels per cob. Thanks. Okay, so kind of an intermediate one here and then moving on to what we have today. Uh, lots of kernels on a corn cob. And, uh, people really good at growing corn effectively. 
a little more about the archaeological evidence. Kind of interesting, just um, it, it's still, I think a lot of pieces need to be put together as far as all the fine details of maybe what civilizations, what cultures had uh, wheat first, what was their wheat like originally, and so on. You can you know, take layers through time and say, all right, who were the first people to have some version of, um, say, like a non-shattering wheat plant? So the wild versions are still, uh, still nutritious, still fairly abundant in a natural setting, but maybe a little more difficult to get uh, the the number of calories for the amount of effort that uh, people later benefit from. Uh, 6,000 years old barley. Uh, as we'll see a little bit later, we have this region that we maybe learn about in social studies class, the, the Fertile Crescent here, modern day uh, Iraq and Iran. Uh, a lot of people, this is uh, Israel and close and nearby countries. Um, this is, was a, a big origin for modern agriculture. So agriculture that kind of took over uh, at least the, the Western world uh, kind of originated here, a Western, Western European world uh, kind of originated in this region and spread from there. So this original cultivation of uh, a lot of the grains we have today, barley and wheat and other ones, uh, originated here and then spread to be one of the major crops throughout uh, Eurasia, North America, other places. Uh, here's a couple other ones. So uh, size of the seed, percentage non-shattering. This is just highlighting a variety of different grains. Uh, so we have rice over here. We've got uh, barley over here. Uh, einkorn is is a relative of wheat. And what that's showing is basically you can take different uh, different plants, and uh, these plants are all in the grain family, and they all basically went through the same kind of selection. So these are. Uh, I guess maybe reliable genetic changes. If you've got a couple thousand years to work with, if you start with one of these wild grass plants, then someday you could have your own domesticated grain, uh, depending on where you're at and what you had to start with. So uh, definite selection for not shattering, uh, a little bit fuzzier, but still a, a pretty consistent increase in the size of the grains of these respective plants. Uh, seed germination. So I hinted at that before when we looked at the, the big diagram. Um, we talked about seed germination before and the benefit of the seed bank, right? So uh, we look at seed bank, there are plants that are dropping seeds onto the ground and uh, a lot of times it's more seeds drop on the ground than they will germinate in the next year, even sometimes in the next few years. And that benefits them to kind of build up their resources uh, if they ever need, let's say they need to germinate back from a decrease in population or something, they might have their seeds abundant in the soil. So great, that benefits the plant. Uh, humans, however, uh, we want to be able to throw seeds in the ground and reliably grow up a plant, right? And I think this is, you know, we get to that germination lab and we try to germinate plants. I think people have a, a familiarity or experience with uh, growing their garden vegetables and the germination rates on those are 90% and above. Like just amazingly high germination. You throw a seed in the ground, you're going to get a plant that grows from that. Sometimes they recommend you put a few seeds in the same hole, but uh, germination percents are very high. Of course, that's what they're selling, right? They're selling you seeds that should be able to germinate. And uh, they have that, they can make that claim because over time people selected for um, seeds that basically bypass all those signal requirements for germination. So it gets us back to one of the more basic 
requirements for germination, seeds typically dry out. And then the next time they're wet after that, that's really, that's all it takes for a lot of the seeds that we put in the ground. So take a dried seed, store that for up to a year or more. And then the next time you plant it, throw it in the ground, give it some water, it should be ready to go. Uh, all right, so over here, we've got uh, peas in this little inset here. And this shows uh, wild pea and germination uh, in the absence of being scarified. Uh, if you remember scarification, that was the process of scratching those up. And uh, these are in the bean family, the legume family. Uh, we actually had pretty good results. <laughs> Very few of our seeds germinated, but a couple of them, the black medic was uh, very reliable for germinating. And that was germinating probably as a result of this being scratched up or scarified. So uh, you take a, a wild pea, scratch it up, you get pretty reliable germination. Uh, of course, that would be something in nature that doesn't happen right away. So the scarification uh, may, under natural conditions, take a few years to happen. So basically saying that they wouldn't all necessarily germinate right away. Uh, however, <clears throat> you take a domesticated pea and scratched or not, when that thing gets exposed to water, it's ready to germinate. So people, again, knowingly or unknowingly, uh, were selecting for basically the seeds that would germinate fastest every year, most reliably. The ones that germinated were the ones that got grown up and had their seeds stored for the next year. Uh, we don't really talk about this, but uh, the plants that people eat are also plants that won't kill them. Let's hope. And uh, it's a little bit of a back and forth. So plants in nature, uh, for the most part, are not trying to be eaten. So they're a little bit difficult to eat sometimes. Uh, and sometimes the, the case is rather extreme of what people will go through to be able to eat something. Uh, this is a rather extreme example that I always found a little interesting. Um, this is the plant we get uh, tapioca from, a plant called cassava or manihot. And, or manioc is another common name for it. <clears throat> and this plant is really toxic as it's alive. Uh, it has a molecule here that has, this is a uh, carbon triple bond to nitrogen, and CN is a component of uh, cyanide. So carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, cyanide, uh, terribly toxic. So what do we do? Um, this is one method. They, they extract the tubers from this plant and they soak them. They go through changes of water, uh, basically leach out the toxic part of this, and the starch part stays behind. Uh, of course, people would have to figure this out over time, figure out what it takes to be able to eat something that otherwise would kill you. So, um, some interesting, I guess, cultural tie ins, right? A culture needs to be able to process their food effectively. So people in uh, lots of parts of the world have this kind of relationship with some of their plants. Again, this is uh, kind of a, a risky endeavor if you don't know what you're doing, but if you do know what you're doing, then you stand to benefit from a food source that uh, might be abundant, might be a little extra stable. If it's a toxic plant, it's not necessarily being eating, eaten by uh, pests as much. So lots of people in the world making taking advantage of toxic plants. And then again, this is the plant you get tapioca from. So if you like tapioca pudding or those uh, bubble teas that have little pearls in the bottom, then you are taking advantage of a terribly toxic plant. Thanks, science. Uh, other, from maybe a little more familiar fruit to us, uh, maybe you've heard about eating apple seeds, right? Don't eat apple seeds. They've got cyanide in them. Uh, sort of. 
So this is a, a good example from a couple of perspectives. We talk about seed germination. Um, so the, the wild version of apple as toxic cyanide producing seeds and a fleshy covering on there that incentivizes an animal to take that carried away somewhere, uh, maybe even to eat the apple but not digest the seeds. And the domesticated version still has troublesome seeds. We don't eat the seeds. We can eat around the core of the apple. Uh, people have domesticated, enriched for more of the fleshy material on here. But still uh, cyanide producing compounds in the seeds. Uh, if you are worried about apple seeds, apparently you have to eat a whole lot of these. Like you have to go to town on apple seeds if you're going to get the cyanide toxicity. Uh, and you have to basically bite into them. So I'm not challenging anybody here, but um, I sometimes will swallow an apple seed. I don't worry about it. The dosage is very small, one at a time. There we go. All right, how many apple seeds does it take to kill you? Uh, so if you weigh 20 pounds, it takes about 30 apple seeds or more to be lethal. You weigh upwards of 200 pounds, you're looking at hundreds of apple seeds. So you really would have to want to eat a lot of apple seeds. Again, not a challenge, but maybe put you put your mind at ease if you're worried about accidental ingesting. What's with the massive range? Uh, I don't know. I imagine, you know, it's not a controlled experiment. I, I imagine they're aggregating data over instances where people have died from eating apple seeds. So uh, there'd be a lot of other factors that we'd have to take into account. And, uh, you know, maybe a person not, I don't know, somebody accurately remembered that they ate 189 seeds. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I <laughs> Take some real dedication. I agree. Um, you know, I, I imagine maybe this, rather than tying this directly to eating apple seeds, I have to go back to the source on this one to remember where I got it from. Um, you know, if you could just correlate cyanide toxicity, sort of take it away from the apples and say, all right, what does it take for a person to die from cyanide poisoning? Uh, there might still be a, a wide range of that, but... Uh, could be other factors, could be a range of cyanide content, depending on the apple variety. I don't know. Too late to do a new research project. Good question. All right, so apples could kill you if you had a whole bunch of seeds. Um, other plants kind of toxic, so um, sort of decreased natural defenses found in plants in the mustard family. Uh, turns out there are a whole bunch of related mustards that people eat. So uh, this is a broccoli plant closely related to a cauliflower plant or a Brussels sprout plant or a, a cabbage plant or kale plant, uh, all pretty close relatives. And this study basically showed that the ones that people have uh, have uh, cultivated for themselves are a little bit less toxic. So maybe not to kill somebody, maybe just unpleasant to eat. Uh, it's kind of pretty widespread if you, if you look at these different groups. So back to potatoes, uh, also native to South America and uh, kind of dangerous, right? You hear about maybe not eating green potatoes uh, potatoes are in the nightshade family, so if they, this kind of harmless starch storing potato, if it's able to produce the compounds that it still has the genetic tools to do, uh, that can be a problem for people. So, fortunately, the kind you get in the grocery store, if you cook them up within a few weeks of getting them, you're probably all right. Uh, squash also potential problematic. Um, so this is another interesting story. Pumpkin soup and a side of squash caused women to lose their hair. Um, so 
They were, as it says, bitter varieties, a particular variety of squash, sort of underlying some of our foods that we maybe take for granted are compounds that can cause you some trouble. Okay. Um, coming back around to a little more of a uh, phylogenetic perspective here. So uh, I mentioned a few times uh, plants in the legume group, plants in the, uh, the grain family. There are a lot of plants that are related to each other that have been cultivated and domesticated uh, kind of repeatedly within relatively small groups. So plants in the grass family, uh, they make seeds, which are what we call grains, and those are uh, advantageous for people or have been in history uh, for a couple of reasons. They're, they're small and compact. They're protected against the outside world. They handle drying pretty well. Uh, they are high in starch, relatively low in toxins. And then through the process of uh, selection we have these versions that are not not shattering and so on uh, they grow well and close together grasses grow in habitats that are uh, can grow in places that are drier so lots of plants in the grass family and then a few all throughout uh, a few different plant families here so uh, apples and strawberries and raspberries all in the rose family uh, lots of members of the bean family fabaceae so some of this has to do with um, kind of a family level trait that benefits people uh, or has benefited, benefited domestication. Um, so we'll focus on a couple of these that are really the, what I call the big two. So these are plant families that are um, basically feature in all civilizations that uh, have settled down. So they basically take their, Ancestors might have been foragers or hunter gatherers, and they settle down and take up agriculture. Um, these are really essentials that are in the diet of agricultural civilizations uh, for a couple of big reasons. Or really, I guess one big reason each. Uh, if you are a vegetarian, or if you've flirted with being a vegetarian, uh, you probably recognize these groups, right? What is it about the members of the legume family that makes them good to eat if you're a vegetarian protein right right so the grass grain family A uh, big source of starch, so you can get lots of energy by storing up uh, rice or corn or whatever you've got for your grains. The legume family. Are. Typically richer in uh, protein. I think we covered this once before. Uh, they have, so on the topic of uh, soil nutrients, plants in the legume family are able to partner with soil bacteria. Uh, so they have a partnership with bacteria that make nitrogen available to them. And nitrogen is an important ingredient in making protein. So uh, basically a, a plant can make, as we saw, make a lot of its molecules just by doing photosynthesis, can make sugar uh, out of air and water. But to make proteins, it needs to have a nitrogen source. So you take a plant and you give it a, a leg up on the nitrogen production, 
then it can turn that into a greater abundance of proteins. And so this plant is generally richer in protein, puts more protein into its seeds, and seeds are what we eat from the legume family. Bada bing, bada boom. So uh, there are, uh, for example, essential amino acids that people need to get from their diet. Uh, if you're vegetarian or you live in a civilization where not a lot of people are eating meat, then uh, you need to supply in some of those amino acids from uh, sort of select plant groups. And so the bean family is pretty good for that. Uh, if you take civilizations, different parts of the world, as we'll see, you can take them from uh, Eastern Asia has, uh, say, rice as its grain and a variety of beans as its legume. Uh, civilizations in North and South America have corn as their grain and a variety of beans as their legume. And uh, there would be some, some meat sources in there too, but... Uh, Agricultural civilizations often come to depend very heavily on the, the plants that they grow. All right, so uh, these are the big ones. Now, as far as where in the world they were uh, domesticated, that's another interesting topic. So people who uh, ancestrally lived in Africa, they had available to them animals and plants that live in Africa, right? So if we go back to, uh, I guess I don't have apples on here, maybe there are. There we go, green apples. Uh, so apples native to kind of central Western Asia here, uh, available to people here, not available to anybody ancestrally living in Africa. They just weren't there, but instead people in Africa had access to uh, other features that are on here. So you see some some overlap in like geographically nearby areas. We've got melons and melons and coffee, uh, palm, so on. And uh, sometimes a little bit of a split in uh, that if we think about the grains and the legumes issue. Uh, in West Africa here, we've got this one, which is uh, sorghum. Over here, sorghum is an African native grain. So here's one, here's one, here's one. Uh, there's also, I forget which, uh, there's another grain here, I forget which one, uh, rice. Uh, African wild rice, there's a bean here. And so these would be what's available, uh, cow peas, uh, black eyed peas. So uh, grains and legumes, as well as some melons available to people ancestrally, ancestrally living in Africa, that's what they were able to start with. That's what they ended up domesticating. And that's a different set of plants than people in uh, Northern Europe, Eastern Asia, uh, North and South America, had different plants available to them. So they had kind of the minimums and then also other plants on top of that. And uh, I think we, we kind of take this for granted because I can go into the store and I can get plants that are native to, you know, in the same grocery store trip, I can get plants that are native to Africa, native to Australia, native to South America. I could get all those in the same grocery trip and they're all just there available to me. Uh, ancestrally, people would not have had that ability so much. So uh, I really enjoy this topic and, and it really, I think, merits reminding people where their food came from originally. Uh, one of the maybe more memorable examples uh, over here, we've got tomato. So tomatoes and potatoes, these were plants that were cultivated by people living in South America. And until people from uh, Europe started sailing across oceans, there were no tomatoes in Europe. There were no potatoes in Europe. They had to encounter the people who had domesticated those crops in South America, um, you know, borrow some of that from them, bring it back to Europe and kind of make it their own. Uh, I always find the tomato example kind of memorable, right? So tomato is like hallmark of Italian cooking. 
it was not available to anybody in Italy before uh, 1500s. <laughs> now it's all over the place. It's also a member of the nightshade family. When it first came to Europe, people weren't so sure about that. Like, you know, you're feeding us what? All right, so thank you, global commerce. Um, this one highlights kind of an interesting feature where we've got uh, plants native to one place that have really boomed uh, with the modern global economy or just maybe being adopted by uh, certain certain cultures. Um, that tells you a little bit about sort of what would be a natural crop for people to grow in an area versus one that maybe is a little more recent uh, recent addition. So if you take uh, maize or what we call corn, this is the global maize output uh, really heavy where we're at no surprise right lots of corn fields around uh, native roughly to mexico um, before people were sailing across oceans this was uh, really widespread throughout north and south america uh, an important crop for native people in in those areas and uh, has since been taken up in parts of northern northern eastern asia a little bit of europe uh, potatoes, another one native to the the high Andes areas of South America, and now grown extensively in Europe and Asia, and so on. Uh, origin of wheat, also big in North and South America. Rice, uh, rice maybe holding most firm at its original domestication location. Uh, as I said, it's an aquatic plant, so it kind of benefits from uh, environmental conditions in that part of the world too. Okay, uh, I mentioned, let's see, nutritional value of corn really low because of selection. Yeah, so the, um, it's one of the things I was kind of getting at here. Um, so people would have a hard time living on most of the grains that are available to us. Uh, if you just ate wheat and wheat products or rice and rice products, it's, it's not very nutritionally complete. Um, it has to do a little bit with the structure of the, the seeds, right? So, uh, well, I won't go into that. I don't know if how, how correct that is anyway. Um, right, so like a grain of, of something in the grass family, the rice family, uh, it's great for energy. People need energy. Um, you know, day to day, you probably need energy I guess, more than nutrition. If you had to choose from something small and nutritionally complete and something energy rich, you get through the day better with something with, with energy in it. But if you want to, you know, maintain and develop, uh, stay healthy over a long time, you need a complete nutrient supplement. To your diet so that's where the legumes came in handy um, you know I, I made it a rather simple split between two kinds of crops um, people would be eating whatever's available to them in an area but um, i think areas like civilizations that they kind of give up the ability to wander or one of the things that happened over human history is people like were not able to move around so much uh, they might not have been able to forage for a variety of foods like they could in the past, and then they have to be dependent on what they can grow near them. Um, it's not so simple as they had one kind of grain and one kind of legume, and that was all they ever ate. Uh, but they would have had a little more limited supply and then more dependence on these. So, um, yeah, you're right. So it's it's not unique to corn. Um, but yeah, the, the grains are kind of relatively lower in nutrients. Uh, all right, so back to domestication. This is uh, kind of one example, one, one extreme example of domestication. Um, these plants all have the same wild ancestor. Uh, these are plants that are uh, selected for different parts. These are all features that we would call vegetables. And uh, if you select for the fatter stem base, you get a plant called kohlrabi. If you select for uh, 
little axillary buds along the stem. You get Brussels sprouts. If you select for a big head of leaves, you get a cabbage. Uh, cauliflower is a developing flower portion, as is broccoli, a little bit different version there. Uh, so the, the florets of broccoli, these are actually flower buds up at the top of the plant. Uh, kale, a little bit different version from cabbage, just selection for leaves again. And if you're, you know, you're familiar with eating these, of course, they have a kind of a similar taste. Uh, plants in the, the um, mustard family, which are these, they, they have that kind of mustardy, uh, sulfury kind of flavor to them. Some people can't stand it. Some people love it. All right, we are uh, nearing the end of our time. So I think we, we basically went over this at the beginning, uh, this idea of grabbing a plant that is useful to you. Um, to be able to have a plant that you can change through selection, you need to have something that's genetically variable. So you can't, uh, you can't just poke a plant and make it produce bigger fruits. You've got to basically choose from among the fruit sizes that those plants provide uh, naturally. So we take advantage of natural genetic variation, uh, which is out there. But uh, sometimes it does take quite a long time. So new variation can crop up through mutations over time, uh, maybe through convenient uh, if you breed different varieties. You might generate a new type of hybrid or something. Uh, but it basically starts from a natural point and uh, works through what, what people can choose. So I mentioned uh, hybridization. Hybridization is one of these processes that can get you uh, kind of a new version of genetic information. Um, I meant to put some images on here. I didn't get didn't get them in time. Uh, some of our most uh, well, some of the the bigger crop plants we have are the result of hybridization. Uh, wheat is ancestrally a hybrid between. Uh, wild varieties of, of their ancestors and relatives. Um, what these are, these are scientific names. The top one is uh, strawberry and the middle, the bottom one here is banana. And these are basically some of the most uh, marketable versions of strawberry and banana are the result of hybridizing a little more natural version. So you take sort of hybrid, you cross one wild version by another wild version, you generate a whole bunch of genetic possibilities, and then select from those. Uh, and then over here, this illustration is from a paper that was highlighting all of the origins of citrus plants. So plants that we call citrus, uh, there's a lot of relationships among them, and uh, some of them are actually basically the ancestors of others. So sweet oranges, grapefruits uh, through selections and combinations when these two arrows meet. It's basically a, a hybrid between these two versions. So uh, citrus grandis and citrus sinensis crossed together ancestrally gave us citrus paradisi, the grapefruit. Over here, a lemon. So a cute little comment said that uh, because of this, people actually People selected and uh, kind of intentionally produced the lemon. They said, life didn't give us lemons. We gave them to ourselves. And maybe we'll end on that thought. All right, so I got just a little bit more of this, and this topic flows nicely into the next and last topic, which will be genetic manipulation. Um, that'll be us on Thursday. Questions? All right. Well, good to see everybody. Have a nice couple days. See you on Thursday.